Hi, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains. That's in Missouri, in the USA. Today, we're going to take a look at the contents of this box, which comes all the way from Japan. Let's jump right in and see what's inside. Here are just a few of the circuit boards I've had made recently by PCBWay, who is nice enough to sponsor this video. So whether you need a few boards or a lot of boards, check out PCBWay. So head on over to PCBWay and get your instant quote on standard circuit boards, flex circuit boards, assembly, and they now also offer rapid prototyping so you can get your mechanical parts made as well. That's an awesome service. So for your next project, head on over to PCBWay. Now don't be confused by the Fragile stickers. This is not from Italy. It is indeed from Japan. There we go. Oh, nice heavy duty box. Ah, cool. Some Japanese newspaper crumpled up for packaging. I always like it when people use newspaper for packaging. It kind of gives you a glimpse into their local area. And let's see, this is for bicycles and scooters and stuff like that. That's about all I can tell. At least I can read the pictures. And some regular brown paper. And some Japanese writing, which I can't read, but I do know what these are. They've done a really nice job packaging these up. Now, these were purchased through the Japanese Yahoo auction, which is kind of like eBay is uh, for Japan, like it is for a lot of other places in the world. And all of these were ordered through there through a po uh, proxy bidding service. You can get an idea of what these are now. This one was actually uh, came with the box and the manual and everything. It's three different sharp PC 8G50s. This one's a VS and I think one's a V and I don't remember what the other one is. It might just be a G850. So let's get the bubbly wrap off of these and have a look. Okay, we'll start with the most diminutive package first, which is this one. Now, I had never ordered uh, anything from Japan like that before. And I asked around on Twitter for recommendations as to what proxy bidding service to use. And I tried one of them, and the process wasn't too bad. Wow, look at that. It's in a nice little plastic sleeve, individually bubble wrapped in a plastic sleeve. Crinkly plastic, direct from Japan. And here we go. Now, these two that uh, were loose were listed as junk, which means they're not guaranteeing they work. You know, they didn't really test them out, that type of thing. Kind of like not tested on uh, eBay, but maybe a little more reliable. It, it seems like even if they think there's a minor problem or a minor blemish or defect, they'll mark it as junk because they don't want you to be disappointed. And don't know if you can see in there. Battery compartment on this one actually looks pretty good. Takes four AAA batteries. There is a system bus connector here. Let's see if we can slide this dude off of here first. There we go. How about that? That looks smart, doesn't it? Yeah. System bus connector. Oh, it slides up. Follow the arrow, Jeffrey. And that is a double-sided PCB edge connector. Even that looks clean under there. And I think this is another expansion bus. 
Yeah, this one's like an 11 or 12 pin. There's a lot of different stuff that people have made to hook to that. A friend of mine has made a breakout experimenters board for that, which I'd like to have made and play with. That would be fun. So there we go. Well, for being listed as junk, that looks like it's in pretty good shape. Um, well, you said we put some batteries in it and see if it works. Went ahead and got my box of batteries out. This is an old Radio Shack box. But it was so convenient, I just saved it to put other batteries in. They used to have really good deals on batteries. They would have big bunches like this, which weren't too bad anyhow, then they would run good sales. You could stock up on batteries. There we go. Oh yeah, see we've got an LCD issue here. Something mode, yep. So, we've probably got like a zebra strip. Oops, I turned it off again. A zebra strip issue on the LCD maybe. Yeah, we definitely have some vertical stripe issues there. Okay, well that gives us something to work on. It doesn't seem to change when we f flex it. So if we get lucky, we'll just need to clean that. If not, we've got a bad LCD or something. But that is part of the fun and risk of buying something more junk. So we'll set this one aside to take apart a little later and we'll jump on to the next uh, one that was wrapped individually. Here is our second individual unit. Complete with the Japanese writing. I'm not sure what that says, but I think I will keep that note because it's kind of neat. Just get over there on the battery case. It took a lot of care packaging these up. Now this is interesting. Check this out. Got a bluish one and a grayish one. Very neat. This one's got a few little scuff marks on it there, but that's not too bad. The back doesn't look too bad either. And this actually has some batteries in it, and they've put a little tape here to keep that from making contact, I guess, while it was in transit. So we can pull these out, and it looks for a sign of corrosion. Yeah, somebody made a nice little piece of tape there to keep that from making contact. And no, I don't see any corrosion there or on the batteries. Some genuine Japanese batteries. I think I have that upside down. Very interesting. Um, all right. Let's put them back in and see what this one does. I'm hoping we'll get to work on at least one of these. One of the ones that were marked junk. The one still in the box is supposed to be in really good shape. There we go. Oh yeah, here's what it's supposed to do. Memory clear. Yes or no. All reset. Okay, well, this one kind of works. The screen is a little dim. I'll try to get it held up here to the camera where you can see it and I can see it. I suspect there is a way to adjust the contrast. I'm trying to look by what's on the keycaps here and I don't see anything that looks like it might be a contrast adjustment. Let me go see if I can find that out in a manual. This was actually a Japanese market pocket computer, but some enthusiasts have made an English language version of the manual, which is super nice. And I will link to that in the description 
below. Now, I did find out by perusing the manual just now that after you do the reset, if you type in FRE and hit enter, it should tell you you have 3179 bytes free. And if you get that number, you're good to go. And then if you press shift and answer, you get the LCD contrast. And you can punch the up and down button here until it shows up nice. And that's pretty good right there. We can kind of see the background, but it gives us a nice contract where we can see it. And then it says we can press the basic or text button. Um, I'm not sure what it's asking me here. Edit, delete. Oh, it's going into the, the text editor. Okay. But that's locked in the contrast, as you can see. So we can type in a text document. Back. Backspace. Need to hold down the shift key. There we go. Awesome. Okay. Well, if we go into basic. Okay. So if we try a basic program well, from run mode, we can go into program mode. Maybe do something like 10. And enter. And then we'll press basic again, go back into run mode. I think we can go shift run, enter. Look at that. It's magical. It says, hey, Bert, all over the screen. Awesome. I press on again, it'll break it. And you'll also notice this says C language right here. You can actually program this in C, but it's a bytecode interpreted C. And it has a assembly language type thing, like a virtual computer type thing uh, designed to teach students how to program in assembly. And you can also program um, this in Z80 Assembler. It has a machine language monitor built in and, you know, base conversion and, you know, bitwise operations and all sorts of crazy stuff like that. Well, that's pretty exciting. This one actually seems to work just fine. It even came with some batteries. So let's get that other one out of the box and see what that looks like. Here we go. This one looked in really good condition in the pictures. Yeah, Got to figure out how it's all taped together. And I have to mention again what a great job they did packaging this up. It's one of my annoyances buying things from eBay is the number of people that just throw something in a box without any real knowledge or thought about how they're packaging it and it arrives all busted. It's very frustrating. And this, they've done a very professional job. Sharp PC8G50VS. This was the last in this series, as I recall. Made in China. Kind of the same stuff all over the box. Pretty nondescript. I guess some of the earlier boxes were a, a blue. The later ones were this color. So way you can tell them apart. Yeah. Wow, they even kept the little plastic sleeve that was in. Interesting. Here is the manual. Oh yeah, it's a good thing there's an English translation of this. Because other than the, the basic keywords, like uh, stuff like that and the button names, I would have no idea what this says. This is quite an extensive manual too. Wow. And it looks pretty much brand new. That is awesome. No one even wrote their name in it. Okay. There we go. We got this in a bag. And what's in the... This says something... Um, 
So maybe this is talking about an AC adapter. I don't know. And here is some other documentation. Um, this looks like something to placing stickers. It's got a little guy with a wrench here, so it's calling somebody for help. Something if there's problems, maybe how to fix it. this final one okay this is like a quick start you see it's it's going through that uh, when you turn it on it asks for the memory clear then you go into run mode okay you saw that on the second machine already here we go this is more of the blue colored case again Take a look at the battery compartment. That looks really nice. No corrosion in there. Okay. I really like this blue. And I think these are designed so you can, yeah, you can slide the cover back on the bottom when you're using it. The other calculator pocket computer type things. And this has the same system bus card edge connector here. And that 11 or 12 pin port there, I think it's 11. This is a pretty common port for a lot of Casio pocket computers and programmable calculators and that type of thing, as I recall. That looks real nice. Let's put batteries in it. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's got a nice high contrast display. So, better than that second one, isn't it? Here we go. We'll get zoomed in on there. Yes, I'll reset. All right. Type in free. Got our memory free. Excellent. And if we press shift and answer, we can. Yeah, I think the display in this later model is a little better. I've seen uh, videos and pictures online of multiple versions of this and that second screen we saw where we needed to get the uh, inside matrix here a little darker to see it well that seems pretty common and in run mode you can use this as a calculator you know 10 plus 10 that type of thing and put your answer over here and I think if you just hit like plus yeah it brings it over 20 plus 20 is 40 times 5 oops not the equals 200 so awesome yeah i expected this one to work fine and look nice and it it really does oh look there's a reset button on it too it was interesting the one with the lcd lines didn't come up with that reset thing initially hmm it's kind of curious isn't it okay well I'm pretty happy that two of these have worked. I figured at least this one would, and between the other two, we could, you know, take them apart and see what's inside and maybe fix one of them, but it looks like we've got just the one to fix. So let's go ahead and take that one apart and see what's inside and see if maybe we can get that LCD working a little better. Okay, here is our malfunctioning unit. This one's also in blue, but this is a v not the vs so this is the series before that last really nice one let's see if we can put the batteries in again get another shot of what that lcd looks like before we try to tear it apart ah see now it came up this time it said memory clear okay 
Yes. Oh, that gives us a really good shot of... There's quite a few columns on that missing, isn't there? Okay, so let's go ahead and enter, and then we'll type in free, enter. So we've got the right amount of RAM showing there. So it seems like computationally it's fine. We just have a display issue. So let's see if we can pop this apart and see how this LCD is connected. If it's like a thermal adhesive bonding, we might be out of luck. If it uses zebra strips, we might be able to clean them. Who knows? Let's have a look. Looks like there's one, two, three, four, five, six screws. I think we'll go ahead and pull these covers off first, like so. I have read that these have a spot for a piezo buzzer inside, but there is not one in there. Oh, look, there's the external power connector. And I imagine that that writing right there tells you about the voltage and polarity, but I think I read online that these are a center negative. Which used to be the thing. know exactly why they like doing it that way in the past, but a whole lot of stuff was that way. If you're prying in the wrong spot, it don't matter how hard you pry. got the battery contacts holding this up and this one here get a flat blade screwdriver for that okay yeah that one there that one there Okay, there is the back cover. Oh, I think that might be the spot where a piezo was. Got some RF shielding here. Okay, set that aside. We've got three blob top chips in here. It's where they put the die right on the board and bond right out to the circuit board. That is a Holtec. HT27C040. That suspiciously sounds like a ROM. This is a custom sharp chip. And oh yeah, look at our LCD connector. That is a thermal adhesive bonding. So it might be kind of out of luck there. And we've got an inductor here. Coming in from the external power to limit noise. Um, this is a ceramic oscillator for the clock. The clock is going right into this ASIC here. We've got all sorts of test pads here. Unpopulated components. All sorts of test pads over here. So, um, I think I will put some test clips on here and power this with the bench supply and we'll try pushing on this ribbon connector here to see if that changes the display. Okay, no doubt you can hear that noisy fan on the bench power supply. I've got it set to 6 volts, 100 milliamps. It's not enabled yet. I've got the test clips hooked up here. And conveniently, they even put on the circuit board which is plus and which is minus. So I will turn on the power supply now. Yep, this thing's drawing almost no clear current. 
Memory clear, yes. We can see we've got a bunch of missing bars. And if I can get my Yeah, I, if you look right here, I can see I'm making a difference on some of the segments. Yep. See there, I've got the the A is all working now. Now some of it's gone. Now it's back. Okay. Yep, this whole side of the screen is better now. Okay. Well that's kind of good we might be able to do something about that with a little bit of heat so we'll give it a shot we've got nothing to lose at this point thermal adhesive bonding is a technique that's quite commonly used with all sorts of displays you can think of it like a conductive hot glue that is applied to one of the components and the two can be physically aligned and heat used to seal the two together and make a good electrical connection what I've done is put a single strip of captan tape over there to help protect it, which may not be necessary, but I'm trying to reseal this in a rather crude way with a soldering iron. I put a nice wide chisel tip in there. I have my temperature set to about 180 C. I'm going to rotate this guy around this way. And I also tried to clean the tip off really well. And what I will try to do is swipe down each set of connections like this. And just carefully Go down that whole connection strip. Then we'll put the batteries back in and see if that makes any difference. Now to initially seal this, they probably had this sort of temperature applied for several seconds. So I'm not sure what we're going to accomplish like this, but nothing ventured, nothing gained. Well, the moment of truth. I went over that you know, up and down like three or four times. Don't know if it made any difference, made it worse, made it better. We'll see. We have power. No, we've still got lots of... You know, power supply was being a little silly there. Memory clear. Okay, yes. So, oh, I think we've made an improvement. Look at this edge. All of this side is now okay. They've got a little on here and here. So kind of like where the P is here and the P is there. And the rest of this looks pretty darn good. So I'd say we give these two areas a little more love. And see what it looks like. Oh, that's encouraging. I marked these two areas on the back. And we'll follow the same procedure. It's hard saying that if these areas go, you know, here go to, you know, directly to the same areas on the front of the screen, it kind of stands to reason that they do. So, yeah, there's a little spot right there that looks funny. That kind of bothers me. I'll get this hooked up to power, and we'll see what happens. Um, positive there. Negative there. I'm going to try to keep that positive from hitting the wrong thing on the back. rather discouraging. Now it's doing nothing. Hmm. Well, there we're hitting the current limit. Why are we getting 
no power. It was all going so swimmingly. Hmm. I'm sure some of you caught this. What I did was reverse polarize these connections. Duh. And pop this little fuse right here. This little surface mount fuse. I don't have one of those, so I set my bench power supply to trip at 10 milliamps. And I just put my clip across the fuse, so we're still semi-safe. And kind of hold that on there. Get this where we can see it. Um, here, let me reset this. Yes. You can see we've got, it looks like, all our segments except... Uh, well, actually, they look okay now. First time I turned this on after figuring out I blew the fuse, it looked like there were still some missing right in here. So I think I'm going to go ahead and heat those up again. And then we'll see what happens. And then I'll have to figure out what value of fuse that is and order one of those in. But this is looking helpful. Okay, if I can just keep from reverse polarizing it again. Okay, I went over that again and I saw just one stripe in through here. Uh, even when it's off, you can kind of see a uh, less dark stripe if that column's not working. So I did it one more time. Uh, when I pressed on it kind of in this area behind the A it came back on so I went over that area again that was probably about the fourth time and now it looks it looks like it's all okay I think maybe if we go uh, like this and we try to make the LCD dark Okay, it's as dark as it's going to go. There we go. Well, you can see we make that whole block really light, and we can make the whole block darker now, so we're hitting every dot. So that looks good. Um, if I press on the back there, it's not changing, so I think we've got a fairly decent bond. Now, this is the type of repair. I, I have no idea how long it's going to last. Uh, it may last a day, a week, you know, or forever. So it's probably not something I would be comfortable uh, selling on to somebody else, but it's you know good to keep around and putter with and maybe use in an interface experiment or you don't mind, you know, if you wind up ruining the thing. But, you know, we've taken it from an, an unusable LCD screen to now it works fine. That's pretty exciting. I was able to get this part of the schematic for the power input from a friend and we can see here that fuse 1, which is for the external power, is 0.25 amp and fuse 2 over here, which is from the battery power, that's probably 0.15 amp, which makes a whole lot more sense than 3 quarters of an amp. I was able to find a suitable replacement from Little Fuse in the 466 series. And they are available in a 200 milliamp rating in the 1206K size, so I'll get one of those to finish fixing this pocket computer. So I'll get a fuse on order for this unit here so we can get that repair finished up. Now this was my first foray into buying these types of things from a Japanese auction, and I was a little hesitant at first, but it was really a good experience. It's not too difficult to do. I've thought about perhaps doing a separate video just on how that process works. Let me know what you think. Is that something you'd be interested in? Now, compared to eBay, for buying multiple units at a time, uh, it's a little less expensive. But, you know, you're not going to be able to return it if something's not right. That's just not practical. So there's a little more risk and perhaps a little savings. And you have a little wider choice on things that were Japanese market only. You have the availability to pick those up or you might not be able to do that directly from eBay. So altogether, I'm very pleased uh, with picking these three units up. I'm tickled pink that all three work uh, despite my mistake in blowing the fuse on that one. I'm really surprised 
that we're able to get that screen fixed. Uh, that thermal adhesive bonding, uh, trying to repair that stuff has never really worked out well for me. And this is great that it did in this particular case. And if you have any questions or comments, just let me know in the comments section down below. I would love to hear from you. And thanks to everyone who helps support the Hey Burt channel through Patreon and other means. You really help keep this channel going, and I appreciate it very much. If you'd like to find out some more information about that, look for some links in the description down below. Well, until next time, bye.